we have, uh, we're going to be having Gordon Hardy come and speak after the uh, offering and announcements. But uh, he's here to share about the Gideons. Thank you, sir, for coming. Um, uh, if the man will come forward at this time uh, to give that portion that God has laid upon your heart to give. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your faithfulness. Worshiping God. Caring for each other. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for every opportunity to return unto you out of obedience, out of faith, out of trust, uh, for the goodness of your hand upon our lives. Uh, Lord, you provide day in and day out. And so now we just return this portion that you've given us to return to you, God. For your good and holy, you be honored and blessed. And I thank you for the blessings that you give. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. My name is Ben, and happy Sunday, happy church day. Um, lots going on in the church. If you weren't here for Sunday school, uh, you were like me, and maybe you have like, a newborn that we're, you, we have yet to figure out how to get out the door on time with our new child on. Um, but we'll figure it out. Uh, but Sunday school is for all ages, different classes for everybody, um, from the littles up to the not littles. Today, during church, you guys heard that uh, Gordy is going to be speaking. You'll see in your bulletin that there is an insert. That is a way to give towards the Gideons. They're going to be outside by the door after church to be able to collect from that. You can make the checks out to, and you'll probably go to the mentions again. To Gideon, who do we make the checks to? Gideon's International. Gideon's International, thank you. Um, he'll come up and talk more about that, but that is what that insert is. Looking in your bulletins, there is a board meeting on Monday at 7.30, so board members that will switch from this past Thursday. We have Riverside Bible Study Tuesday at 10.30 on Wednesday. There are classes here for all ages again. Um, we are getting ready for our statewide camp out in the Royal Rangers class right now. So the kids are memorizing some verses that they'll need for their skillorama. And um, actually there's a bunch of them down in Iowa this weekend with John and Becky right now. Also on Wednesday is a young adults slash youth combination. Julia's pumped. So I don't have a lot of details, but they're all together is my understanding. I'm not giving you any confirmation, so I'll just make it up. They're all together, and it's going to be a fun time. So if you are a young adult or a youth, come on out. You guys will be hanging out. I see Chris in the back going like this. And at first I thought he was saying, like, you're just, like, yapping. But he was just going like that. Colton. Yes, that's fine. Um, Friday, we have men's advance going to Lake Geneva. Saturday, there's a mission trip fundraiser for a spaghetti meal. Um, other things coming up, we do have our Wild Game Week coming up, and if you're looking to volunteer for that, next Sunday after church is a meeting. And just as another note, um, the Casino Country School, uh, the start date did get pushed back a little bit. We're working through a few things there, but if you are interested in enrolling or working, see Shelly Cadis. Um, it's a great opportunity here. This Sunday night, or tonight, Bruce is talking. That was the other thing. So, Bruce wanted to say a little bit, and then we'll pass it over to you. Has Sandy been beating you up a little bit lately? That's to all of us. God's, I believe, given me a message to speak tonight about a two-fisted approach Pentecost of power, the hammer of holiness, sure to knock the devil on his back. On tonight, you'll hear, you'll hear about that. It's like old home week coming up here. It reminds me of my days in Pillager High when I graduated with David Martin. And uh, my older brother Jerry was best friends with Ronnie Martin. 
And that reminds me, if you've ever ridden in the back seat of that old 54 with Ronnie Martin, you'll never forget it. I've been there. I don't know how many of those Fords you pulled, but it worked it quite all of a sudden. Anyway, today, I was actually going to ask you to take a look at that. Make sure every one of you had one of these stuck inside your church bulletin, because I didn't want you reading it during the pastor's sermon, because, you know, what God lays on his heart, we want to hear. But right in the very front, I have, a, I have a son that never carries cash. It's got to be credit card. Well, the Gideon finally learned to put a little flap at the front of there, and that's the credit card thing, so it's there. And you know, it's been a long, a long time since uh, last summer, some guy's been laid off all winter. The really broker announced it just ain't a good day for an old Gideon to come here. So they put an envelope, too, on the back, and you'll notice it's got our camp address on it. If today's not a good day for you, just stick that in your Bible and you can mail that in any time that God lays it on your heart if you want to buy some Bibles. You know, sometimes you wonder, those little New Testaments do you buy when the Gideon comes here? Does it really do any good? You know, it's just a little book. In the, in the front of it, it's got the, the helps. It's got things that if you have anxiety, it'll tell you exactly what page to go and read about anxiety. See what God's got to say about that. You got somebody that's troubled and they're thinking suicide? Got that little list there too. I'll tell you what page to go and read about that. And my little story today, it's important that in the back cover, you remember the Roman road, the plan of salvation is there, along with the decision page right across from it. My second story is about that. But the first one I want to tell you about was some Gideons were doing a, a school distribution. And as all the fourth and fifth leaders were instructed to come out, if they wanted a New Testament, they could have it. And we still do that in our area schools around here. They all came out. They were all getting them. And after the whole line went through, the guys were packing them all up. They had a few left, so they were boxing them up and getting ready to leave. And guess what? The tension got out. You've all heard of the naughty boy? I've been there sometimes back in school days. But anyway, the naughty boy came out. He come by. Oh, just kidding, and seen him. Another kid coming, so he opens the box, he gets out of my Bible. Here, you know, I have a free gift for you. Kid looks at what that is. It's a Bible for you. Kid says, I don't want a Bible. Whoa! He flung that thing clean across the street. Well, it just so happened that day, there was a drunk walking on the other side of the street, and he had a bad attitude. In fact, he was going to go home and lay a whooping on his wife. And he was going to leave the house. Leave him. All of a sudden, that guy's walking along and whoop! Something hit him right in the head. He looked down. What's this? And he picked it up and he looked. A Bible. Wow, he said, God must be trying to get my attention. You know, that guy went home. And the more he thought about it, he started reading that. He didn't lay that weapon on his wife. But a few weeks later, at a Gideon breakfast, one of the guys come in and he said, hey, i got to tell you a story about this friend of mine. And he said, he's got a drinking problem. And he got hit in the head with a Bible. And he went home and he started reading it. And the more he read it, he finally decided to give his life to Jesus. So he brought that report back to that Gideon meeting. So it just goes to show you that you know, the naughty kid throwing the Bible away. God can still use it, can he? The other little story I wanted to share with you was down in Chile, South America. There was a little girl in fourth grade, and she was sitting there reading her New Testament. Her daddy come home from work and look, what do you got there? She said, I got a Bible today at school. He said, young lady, you're not going to read that book in this house. Now put it away and help your mom get ready for supper here. Get it put away. So she goes and puts it away. Next morning, Dad gets up and he's getting ready for work and he's about to go out the door. He looks and here's his daughter. She's sitting over there reading that Bible book. He said, I thought I told you we were not to read that book in this house. And he grabbed it away from her. Stuck it in his pocket. Off the work he went in the mine. Later that day, in that mine, there was a cave in. And even though the crews worked feverishly to get out, by the time they finally broke through and found those men, it was too late. I have a hard time with this part. In the hands of that little girl's daddy, he had that Bible. He had turned to that back page and read that. And he signed the decision page that this day 
I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Fortunately, they had enough time on the headlights on their helmets and enough oxygen that each of the men, the 19 other guys down there with him, had all signed their names in that book. That name. So, when the old Gideon stands at that back door and he's got that open Bible, some people say, well, I want to buy a whole box of like, your wife, I just gave her a few boxes, like 250. I'll be joining Karen at the, uh, is she the one that's going to be at the school? At First Baptist, I mean, Wednesday, 1 o'clock. I'm supposed to be there, help give out the Bibles to the kids. I think I'll bring my old one that I got over at Quarry Brook School in 1952, I think it was, and share with the children. You know, God makes a difference. So, yeah, there's 50 of them in a box, and some people want to write a check for $50 and buy a box of them. Some people want to just put in a dollar twenty-six to buy your one bike. That's what they do. But anyway, I'll be at the back door, and you just pray about it. And guys, maybe I should speak to the ladies. Some of you ladies elbow your husband a little bit here that it wouldn't be a bad idea to be a Gideon. You love, that's the first thing. You have to love Jesus. And uh, you don't have to go to churches and do this Gideon report like I'm doing today. Our dues in our organization pay for our headquarters in Nashville and all our expenses to run the operation. And there are people that never go out to churches and speak. Some of our people can't even make our Tuesday morning prayer breakfast that we do every Tuesday at the Wings Cafe at the airport there. And some of them can't make the once a month, second, th second Thursday of every month, we'll be at Pizza Ranch. Some of you want to come, I'll tell you what, first time I'll buy you dinner. So second Thursday every month, six o'clock, we're there. That's our monthly meeting. Some of the guys can't even make them, but you know their dues still help keep the organization going and they pray for our organization. Number one thing, pray. God honors prayer. But there are some of you, right? See my cousin Rosalind back here today with her son David, and I'm thinking, David, David, maybe God's speaking to your heart about being a Gideon. I'm just reminding you in case. Okay? I'll be at the back row. Thank you, Pastor, so much for having me. God bless you. Church, you guys ready to go? Were you bugging out or did they already leave? <laughs> All right. Children's Church just got old. <laughs> we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. chapter 5, kind of going back, back to the basics. Um, you know, you take God's word. Uh, let, let, let me pray one more time. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can gather here in this place. Uh, Lord, and the, the, uh, the things that the children are going to be doing, Lord, uh, bless them. Bless them. Let them know you at that early age. Let them walk with you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your word that as we look through this, how simple and how complex it is. The simplicity of being in a relationship with you. And yet when we look at your plan for our lives, how from the very beginning you have laid it out that we can receive such good and glorious things. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your authority. I thank you for your justice. Lord, you be praised. And, and may each heart be, find a challenge, find a conviction. Lord, may there be an encouragement that is brought through this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
as I began to talk, I thought, you know, boy, I better pray before this one. Um, as I prayed, uh, as you heard me pray, God's word is pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty simple. What's God's message? That he loves us, right? I mean, if, if we just, if, if we take God's word at that, okay, God loves us. And we know that in that love, he sent his only son, that, that he would be crucified, dead, buried, and uh, rise from the dead, conquering death. That in Christ Jesus, all who call upon the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Okay? Who doesn't want to be saved? It's pretty simple in that, right? But as we grow in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue to dig into God's word, it, it, at the surface of it, God loves you is such a happy-go-lucky statement, right? But as we grow in our faith, as we grow in this love relationship with Jesus Christ, we realize, or we ought to begin to realize, that you know what? It wasn't it isn't just for this happy-go-lucky life. In fact, it's not even for this life on the earth. It's to take us into eternity. Yes, while we live on this earth, we receive those blessings, we receive that peace, we receive that strength, we receive that, uh, dare I say, discipline in our life from the Spirit, saying, Hey, let's pick up this cause. Let's take up this uh, purpose. Let's get rid of this. And, and just that process of uh, sanctifying or purifying or uh, making up my life and your life in Christ Jesus, what it ought to be. Right? That's where, that's where it really hits the road. So when we begin to walk in the Lord Jesus Christ, and oh, thank you for that love and that mercy and that salvation that I have in you, Lord. What can I do for you? How can I bless you? Becomes that indwelling spiritual cry that, Lord, I want to do something to honor and glorify you. I want to bless you for your blessing in me. And now our mind begins to switch from that self-centered individual that we once were to this Christ-centered individual that we are now and this whole process, lifelong, until we breathe our last breath, this whole process of pressing forward. Let's begin reading in verse uh, uh, here? 6. I want to back up to that verse. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Point number one, this world is not our home. Amen? In Christ Jesus, we begin to realize that more and more every day. Paul says it, right? For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. His desire, or, you know, in that relationship with Christ, it was, I want to be with Jesus. Is Jesus with us right now? Was Jesus with Paul when he was writing these words? So what is Paul saying? If Jesus was with him, why is Paul saying, I want to be present with him? Because the reality of it is, is this temporal, perishable, corruptible body is going to come to an end. But there's something in us that's eternal, and that's going to press on into the eternity. And Paul is pressing this, not just upon himself, he's pressing it out to us. Is that our yearning? Is that our yearning to be present with God? To be present with the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, hear what it says. We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. Well, Jesus is with me. He's not, what? Jesus is calling us into that spiritual relationship, into that spiritual presence. Now, don't, as, as we go through this, um, I forget that group out, I think it was in California, San Francisco area, I think. 
uh, when Haley's Comet was coming around, there was that group that all drank Kool-Aid because they were gonna hop on the Comet as it flew past. You remember that? Woo, what was it? Thank you. Okay, heaven's gate. I'm not calling us to that. Jesus isn't calling us to that. Jesus is calling us into this relationship that we begin to yearn more for him than anything on this earth. That doesn't mean we neglect things on this earth. That doesn't mean we, we uh, stop taking care of uh, relationships or the things that he has given us to care for. That doesn't, I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is those be things become less and less important to us. The things. People, on the other hand, will always maintain this high value in our lives. People. Okay? Because they're the only ones that have that eternity stamped on them. They're the only ones we can, we can influence. We know that uh, the, that statement, this world is not our home, we're just passing through. Uh, I, I got a, a, a sweatshirt said, this is not my home, I'm here recruiting. Uh, you know, so I might uh, begin to use that one. That's a great, uh, great way of saying, uh, saying the same thing. This world's not my home. I'm just here recruiting people to go where my home is. Okay? But the, 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 there's two ideas that, that Paul's bringing out here. While we live on this earth, there is, there is a kind of separation, a, a distance in the reality of being in, in with Jesus. There's a limitation of what our bodies, our physicalness, can absorb and, take and, and understand and receive in Jesus Christ. There's a limitation. But when we step over, when we breathe our last breath, when we breathe our last breath, or when He returns on the cloud and raptures us home, I'm going to be in his presence completely. No, no, incor no corruptible. It's all incorruption. It's all imperishable. It's all eternal. There's going to be a fullness. If you recall uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, the greatest of, uh, or these three remain. What are they? Faith, love. Which one will only exist in eternity? Love. Why? Because when I am face to face with Jesus, it's not going to require faith anymore. It's not going to require hope. I've realized them both. But that love is going to continue on because that is the relationship that we have in Christ Jesus. But we hear Paul's statement there in verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. There's, there's a kind of a yearning in Paul's voice and statement. Pressing it out to the body of believers. Is this your desire? Is this your greatest desire? And again, I... <laughs> Uh, lest somebody think, well, are you, can we, uh, uh, can we end our own life then and go on to the next? No. There's only one that gets to take care of life and death. That's God. He has appointed our days. And we are to be faithful in fulfilling those days that he's given us to do. So point number one, may this drive home in your heart and cause a, uh, a, a conviction to rise up within you to realize that this world is not your home. We have greater things ahead of us. So there's that promise and that hope and that joy that we will receive. Pressing on into the verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust well known in your consciences. Paul's writing this letter from his, uh, from his standpoint, and, and 
uh, he knows his position with God. He knows where he is standing. But in this passage, you hear what Paul's saying. There's judgment for everyone. Oh, but wait a minute. If I'm saved in Jesus Christ, I'm not going to be judged. You're not going to be condemned. You're not going to be condemned. For in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And yet, Paul is telling us, here's the reality of it. The works that we've done, and, and we are not a people of works. There, there's, there, there's nothing more that you can do in your life. You can't attend church seven days a week, 365 days a year, um, and, and give your tithe every day, every day. That's not going to make you any closer or further into salvation. Your salvation is based upon who you say Jesus Christ is. But in Jesus Christ, as we walk with him, now we begin out of this relationship, this love relationship uh, with, with Christ, we begin to love as he loved. We begin to do as he did. Okay? We begin to play these things out in our lives, or we neglect these things that we know we ought to do, but we refuse to do. Okay? Or we do things that, well, you know, I know God loves me, I know I'm forgiven. Oh, whoops, I probably shouldn't have done what I just did. Okay? These things are going to be placed before. Uh, they call this the, the Bema seat, the Bema seat, however you want to uh, state it. Okay? It's the Bema seat. What does Bema mean? It's, uh, or Bema? It's Greek word meaning judgment seat. That deep or theological, right? So when you hear the Bema seat, the Bema seat, it, it's purely, as, as it states in Scripture here, it's just this judgment seat that Christ is going to sit on that he's going to judge all the saints. He's going to judge the works. So all these works are going to be placed into a fire, into a, a, a smeltering pot. And what burns up is going to be burned up. It's going to be done with. There, there's nothing there to, be, to, to, to even offer back to God. But there's going to be other jewels and, and or, or gold. Let's just say it's gold. Gold is going to be all of a sudden there. The impurities are going to be burned out. And that gold that is received by the, the actions of my life, the words of my life, the thoughts of my life, all of this into this smeltering pot, it's all going to be burned up, purified, and what is left is my reward. Okay? My eternal life in Jesus Christ is solid. I'm going to have eternity in G with Jesus Christ because I believe in Him. I believe He is my Lord and Savior. I'm going to place my faith in Him and Him alone. But on this day, at this judgment seat, where these things are burned up, He's going to say, This is your reward. This is, this is what you have received from me. You have eternal life, but this is, this is your reward. This is my reward. It's your reward. <laughs> now we know that we're going to take that and say, Lord, it was done for you here. So we are going to receive rewards. Okay? Now, um, alongside of this passage, Judgment Seat, uh, just pencil in, well, if you don't like it, in your notebook, pencil in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. Because for some reason, he was trying to drive this whole point home uh, to the Corinthians. Kind of talks about this a couple times. Beginning in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. Yet let each one take how 
he builds on it. Take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, and each one's work will become clear, uh, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, uh, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. So I'll still be saved whether I do something for Christ or not, right? Is that what we get out of it? Some do. Oh, I'll still be saved. I just got to call on him then. Okay. I'm good. What kind of relationship is that? Is, is that? is that the relationship Christ is calling us to? No. He's calling us to do exactly what he did. Lay down his life. Daily pick up the cross. Daily pick up this life struggle of walking with God in Christ Jesus. And as we begin to do that through our thoughts, through our words, through our actions. And, 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 and our actions are, I, I'm telling you this. You are being observed by people. Particularly if you make it known, if, if it is known that you are a Christian, people are observing you. First, I think, uh, particularly if they're uh, kind of uh, cynical individuals, they're looking for you to be a hypocrite. Okay? So, just FYI, chances are you may be a hypocrite. So when you're called on the carpet for being said hypocrite, just admit it. Ah, did I do that? Did I say that? Yep. You're right. I shouldn't be saying that. I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Instead of, who are you? You're not saved. I'm saved. I'm righteous. You're not righteous. Who are you? What right do you have to say? Right? But when we begin to show that humility, in that, when they observe that in us, we are preaching the gospel. Amen. We are preaching the gospel. And in the manner in which we live is part of this gold or this wood or this hay that's going to be placed in that pot. Be careful. People are watching us. And they should be. We should be willing to say, yes, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, when they say, well, you, you were mean to me the other day. Really, what did I do? Oh, you're right. I did cut you off on the road. My apologies for that. You know, it, it's, I, I'm sure it wasn't in, 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 you know, being vindictive or mean. It was, how many have ever crossed in front of somebody absent-mindedly. Yeah. Okay? It happens. And so when it happens to you, just let it come back and think, you know, I've probably done this just the other day, so he's all right. Instead of whatever you do. But those are the things. Those are the things. Yes, be involved in the body of Christ. God, uh, Paul writes about this in, in 1 Corinthians as well. That we are a body of Christ. Everyone's significant. Everyone's important. Everyone needs to be involved. Well, I can't sing. I can't either. You see me singing? No. Well, I can't preach. Oh. Um. <laughs> I would tell you, I can't preach. <laughs> if you would have asked me in high school, I would have said, no way. I can't talk. So, so anytime when I'm up here, <laughs> Lord, I know it. My flesh comes out sometimes. I have said jokes that are funny 
that should never have been fed. Especially from here. <laughs> I get it. But when we are called to do things that we feel inadequate for, we sweat and we cry out, why me, Lord? And then we say, Father God, please show up. Let your spirit flow through me. You'll hear that from many, many speakers, guest speakers that come. You'll hear that when uh, Sunday nights and numerous uh, people, when they pray, Lord, let these words be yours. All, of, all these things that we do as, as part of the body of Christ, loving one another, caring for one another, building one another up, all these things, the being a seed, that we have to look forward, not to fear, not to fear, but to go and say, Lord, this is all done for you. You be honored. Now there's other seeds that are other judgments that take place. You begin even at the very beginning of the of the Bible. There's uh, the judgment on Adam and Eve and that first sin upon the serpent. Um, uh, you know, then going through uh, Noah's uh, the flood that Noah survived. The judgment upon the earth of all the wickedness, uh, and then pressing it out into the future. We know there's a there's going to be a judgment. Of nations from Matthew 24. There's going to be the great white throne judgment at the very end of all things, which is going to pull up the Lamb's Book of Life and, and also other books that list what everybody has done. Okay? So there's, there's different judgment seats that take place or judgments throughout the Bible, but in this particular case, um, we find this particular Bema seat, Bema seat um, judgment seat of Christ in particular for believers. So my encouragement, uh, and, and maybe not encouragement, but uh, challenge, maybe a conviction. Um, as it's, it says there uh, in verse 11, we persuade men, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We desire that all men would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just to stop there, but we desire all men, uh, all mankind, to come to know the Lord Jesus, to press deeper into this relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't wait on the shoreline. Go out. Get closer to that drop-off. Just saying that kind of makes me nervous. I'm not a swimmer, so I'm like, well, I don't think so. But the relationship with Jesus Christ is meant to draw us further and further into his word, into the relationship with him, into relationship with one another. Is that what's happening to take place here? So point number one, this world is not our home. Point number two, there is judgment for all. Point number three, reconciliation. It is God's offer. Verse 12, for we do not com commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are out of our sound mind, it is for you. Isn't that an interesting thing? If we seem like we're crazy, it's because it's for God. If it seems like we are of sound mind, it's okay, it's for you. Let's go all out for God. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all. And those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have, according, uh, or even though we have known Christ According to the flesh, now we know him no, uh, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of recon reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though we are pleading, God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may, might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, point three, reconciliation. It is God's offer, beginning in Genesis 3.15, the prophecy where his, uh, uh, his uh, heel shall bruise your head and uh, you shall bruise his heel. That was the, that was the first uh, prophecy that God is sending a Messiah, a Savior, that was going to save the earth. And there's many that follow. There's many of, of those um, prophecies that would follow. And it's found in Christ. Verse 14 and 15. Look how he emphasizes this. First, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us. That if one died for all, that is, if Christ died for all, then all died. And he died for all those who live, should no longer uh, live for themselves, but for him who died, that is Christ who died for them and rose again. Down to verse uh, 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now it's for man's response. In that, God has made this offer. God has laid this out here. Do you hear Paul's words? We implore you. We compel you. We are compelled to persuade men. We, are, we want to implore you. We want to beseech you. We don't talk like that anymore, right? We say things like, oh, we want to make it very important to you. But how beautiful are those words, seemingly of old. I beseech you. I implore you. Choose Christ. Choose Christ for salvation, for forgiveness, for reconciliation. Six, seven times the word reconcile came up in some form, right? In those passages. I think Paul is trying to get the point across. God reconciled the world through his son, Jesus Christ. God did the work. Jesus did the work. We receive the peace. We receive that relationship in Christ Jesus. They did the work for us, and now they're saying, here it is. This morning in um, Sunday school, we kind of talked about this. We took in Malachi, return to me, and I'll return to you. The faithfulness of God saying, Lord, saying to the people, hey, you, you, you turn your heart back towards me. I'm here. I'm here. I'm, you know, the prodigal son. What happened? The son turned his heart back towards the father. Father took off, right? It's, it's like laying up here. Uh, I'll make it. I'll say a, a, a wad of $1,000. Stack of $100 bills. If I just set it down there, I set it for the first person who comes and gets it. How many of us would hesitate? How many of us would be the, hey, I'm going to get it. I don't care what people think. I don't care what they, if they think I'm in need or if I'm just selfish or whatever. Don't care. I want the thousand dollars. Right? If I put down ten thousand dollars, how many of your how many of your in your lives would your pride begin to diminish? and the need for $10,000 become greater. <coughs> it's that pride in us that says, well, somebody else probably needs it more than me. If I laid down $100,000, now where's your pride? <laughs> Don't care, right? 
that can get me a whole bunch of Snicker bars. Okay, I'm thinking small, okay? But, but do you see what happens? Every week, every week, every day, when we preach the good news, when we preach the good news, we're saying, here's a thousand dollars. It's yours for the taking. What's keeping you from saying, Jesus? That's Jesus. Saying, Jesus is saying, come, receive me. Find the forgiveness. Find the acceptance of my Father to you. Come as you are, but leave where you're at. And in following Jesus Christ, we're going towards him, which means we're not, we're not staying in one place. We're continuing to grow, continue, continuing to mature. <laughs> so as it says in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. If you are not in a right relationship this morning for you, it's that proverbial thousand, hundred thousand, whatever amount you want, put on. It's life or death. Do you want life? Every hand would go up, as I do. Then step from where you're at to move to give. Come as you are, but leave where you're at. God doesn't want us to stay in the muck and the mire of our sin. He wants us to move out and be made new. If you don't know Jesus, call upon Jesus. Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. Let me find forgiveness. Let me find the acceptance that, that has been, been being preached today. Let my life be reconciled to you, O oh God. Don't hesitate. If you make that decision, when you make that decision, tell somebody about it. If you're making that decision today, tell somebody in here about it today. The men and women of God being reconciled through Jesus Christ, standing in that right relationship. Are we continuing to move forward that on that day, at that banana seat judgment, at that judgment seat of Christ, when everything's poured in, will we have something to show for our love for Jesus? Now, I've got to be careful how I ask that. It's not about works. It's not about, yeah, I'm going to get a huge crown, I'm going to get a huge blob of gold, yay! Oh, it's about realizing what God saved us from. That we want to do things to honor and glorify Him. Every aspect of our living. Heavenly Father, I pray for each one of us here. Lord, if it's a man or woman that's given their heart to you, Lord, let them uh, be free. Let them experience that salvation, that reconciliation that is found in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you and praise you for that offer. I thank you, Lord, for the, the reality that this world is not our home. I thank you that um, we are just passing through. We're just here momentarily. And then we step into the reality of eternity. Father, help us to continue to step deeper and deeper into that ocean of yours into, and climb higher on that mountain of yours and go farther on that racetrack of yours, God. Let us not be hindered by the things of this world. Let us press closer to you in your goodness and mercy. Father, may that these decisions that your spirit brings to us to make, Lord, help us to make them. Help us to deal with it today by your Spirit's work in us. We thank you and praise you. You're good, you're holy. Pray your blessing upon each individual here. Thank you for your love. Jesus.